out out here and the thinness of the veil between the material and the metaphysical, which we're thinking about a lot. Early 20th century California was really fertile ground for a lot of really interesting esoteric religious ideas. Uh, untethered from the conservatism of the East Coast, people came to the West Coast and they felt free to explore ideas. Um, there was a freedom of thought, thought here that nurtured creation in the support of these various religious ideas. By 1920, there were 800 orders in, in the United States and over 50 million, half the adult population belonged to some kind of sect or religious order. And when you think about the more commonly well-known ones, they are the Shriners, the Elks, the Rotary. Mm -hmm. But there are also more esoteric groups like the Rosicrucians, um, the Theosophists, the Philosoph, uh, the, um, sorry, hold on, uh, the Order of the Golden Dawn, the Philosophical Research Center in Los Angeles, um, the Theosophical Society, the Dan uh, Madame Blavatsky. Mm -hmm. And between 1916 and 1925, there were actually 32 new religious organizations that appeared in Los Angeles alone. So there was this just foment of creativity and excitement around those ideas. Um, the paintings of Edith Valentine Tenbrink a Los Angeles woman working in the late 20s to the 40s is a part of that tradition. Edith Valentine Smith was born in Dodge City, Iowa in 1883. She was born on Valentine's Day, thus her middle name. She had an early marriage which uh, kind of fell apart and she found her soulmate and her second husband, John Tenbrink. She and John got a, a note from a friend in LA who said, you gotta come out here. I think the quote was, um, there's a lively esoteric and spiritual scene here. So it was like this smorgasbord of ideas and spiritualism. So they packed up and they moved to LA in 1920. Um, John got a, a, a job at a local high school as a custodian and on that salary they traveled to India and Egypt. Um, they were inspired by the idiosyncratic religious movements that made Southern California a mecca for spiritual seekers. Once established in LA, they founded the Ancient Order of the Golden Precept, which seems to have been influenced by many streams of esoteric knowledge that were swirling around, which we were talking about earlier. Um, she pulls from theosophy, uh, westernized Hinduism, westernized Buddha, Buddhism. She's pulling from, uh, you can see that she's looking at Kundalini Yoga, and there's the, the subtle body here and the and, and um, yeah, the chakras and such, right? So she's pulling it from all different um, systems. There are two scholars at UCLA, Stephen uh, Waymeyer and Carrie Noonan, who's actually written four really beautiful um, scholarly uh, articles about the work. And they propose that instead of outsider art or visionary art, we should think of this as initiatory art. So this was art that was used to initiate people into their religious ideas. So say if you didn't have a church, or you didn't have a temple, you could create a mystic or um, a, a, a space that had kind of an esoteric feeling by pulling these pieces into the space. Um, let's see, what they felt that they had discovered was that there was an ancient order of the Burmalis, what was the name of the, uh, hold on just a second. There was an ancient group of mystics called the Furamatists from the Himalayas, and they felt that, that what they had discovered had come from those people, had been descended. Um, there was a mythical prince from Egypt and Persia who traveled to India and founded the Furamatist Lodge. The lodge was an order of sages who achieved mystic wisdom and psychic powers. Tenbrink's order was meant to be a direct descendant passing on this ancient wisdom. <laughs> um, influenced by the American spiritualist movement, they felt that they got some of this message from, from mediums, from the dead. They actually referred to one of the mediums as being uh, Obadiah, who helped her to paint these paintings. So they were reaching in lots of different directions. John and Edith left detailed instructions on how 
the ritual environment that they should create should look like. Um, they should be wearing robes of red and gold and white. No jazz or ragtime was to be played during them. <laughs> it was too, too much. Um, and there were even like body language and gestures that was kind of choreographed that they designed. There's no evidence that there was any kind of influence that's, that bled out from them. They didn't convert people. They didn't live past their lifetimes. But they sure gave it a, a college try, right? <laughs> um, Edith's paintings are used as visual and inspirational tools to accompany their lectures of the seven keys of the masters. These seven keys included faith, power, wisdom, progress, health, wealth, and happiness. And at the end of every one of their lectures, they would say, purity, progress, and prosperity. So it was a very positive message, right? Something we can all kind of get behind. The paintings include um, occult symbols, most notably Masonic symbols. You can see that there are things like the, the all-seeing eye and the pyramid and the scimitar with the crescent moon. These are all things she's borrowing from other religious orders that are proliferating. She probably came, if she came from the Midwest, from Iowa, her father or her, you know, there might be an auxiliary mother or the, a female uh, group, they would have, she would have been familiar with those kind of symbols. So she's pulling those all together to, to be a part of the, what she's creating here. Um, she was most, pro, most prolific in the 30s and 40s. Um, these, after her death and after her husband's death, these paintings got separated into two groups. One group got, was found in an abandoned house in the attic, and it was sold to a Tennessee dealer of outsider art. So those exist on their own. This collection was um, found by Bobby first, and I think I want to introduce you, Bobby, and have you tell a little bit about how you found him. Well, I was <coughs> at, at uh, I was still living in Laurel Canyon, and I go to the Fairfax High School flea market. And I went to Fairfax High School, and I knew this guy Bob, who was a way older than me, uh, a vet who had both health and PTSD issues, and was you know kind of always struggling. But he was a really wonderful character, and I you know always he found amazing things, but stuff from all over the place because my I go all over the place, you know, I kind of collect weird stuff. So I showed up, Bob had these paintings and I, you know, was going around the flea market, I stopped at Bob's and I said, What are all these paintings? And he goes, Oh well, I I, I you know, found these but they gotta go as a collection. So people are trying to buy one of them or two of them and I go, No, no, they all gotta stay together. And you know he had a price on him that was way out of my budget. So <clears throat> I'm wandering around the flea market, and at the end of the day, I stop back by Bob. He's starting to pack stuff up. I said, "Well, you still have those paintings?" He goes, "Yeah, nobody would, you know, go for getting them all." So I said, "Well, I can't ask anywhere, you know, pay you anything close to what you're asking for it, but I'll." You know, I'll give you this, and it was enough to, you know, say, okay, I need the money, I, I like you, you're going to take care of them, and they're all together, so I acquired them. How many? Uh, 39. 39. Wow. And he didn't know who the artist was. <laughs> yeah, because they're all signed, except for one painting, they're all signed with just initials, and uh, most of them have a date, but a lot of them don't have a date. EVT. What the heck is EVT, <laughs> right? So one of them was signed Edith V, but the last name was like, you know, Ten Brink. And it's like, you know, it was indecipherable. So I was working for an artist in LA, uh, Tony Berland, and I showed them to him. I said, ah, I found all these amazing paintings, you know, and he's looking through them and he goes, oh, let me call my friend Peter Tukoski. He works at the Clapton Folk Art Museum. So. I got in contact with Peter, and over time he found out about Stephen and uh, yes. his wife. Yes, they were two professors at UCLA who discovered the, the tranche that went to Memphis, and they were really turned on by the work, and they wrote at least four scholarly articles that I've read. They're fantastic. Yeah. And um, so 
I read them so many years ago, I don't even remember. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm not a reader around my hands up sort of guy. You know, I'm a visual person, so, you know, for me it's color, shape, form, texture, etc. I'm not a, you know. Right. <coughs> uh, but at Tony for Lance, they spent, they, I think they got stoned or something. <laughs> they were going, okay, what is this, what is this signature? Right. Before they were found about these people that were writing about it. Right. And then somehow they all have this revelation. They figured out what the what that ten brain scribble mm -hmm. was, what it meant. and that. But that took that took well, a yeah, long well, time. Yeah. <laughs> right. it, it, it's through Peter heard about um, uh, uh, Stephen and his wife Carrie. Mm -hmm. Carrie and. <clears throat> I contacted them and they said, uh, did you say EVT? I said, yeah. And they says, oh, Edith Valentine Tenbrink. I knew it was Edith V something. And at the time they had But no you idea. couldn't even tell it was a T. And, you know, it was just like all over the place. It's like this big on the back of one painting. Were they thrilled to know that there was another? Yeah. So no, it was like, like what? Yeah. You know, so it was kind of Short. through Peter and them knowing about it. So they introduced me to the woman that had the other part of the collection that they had already found her and done research through her. She was living in a, in a, in a She was living in, in, a, in Whittier in a trailer park with her autistic daughter. <laughs> and so, she still had all the ephemeral material even though she had sold all the paintings. So while Bobby had half the paintings, he didn't well, have I any of the writings or the photographs. I didn't have any of the writings or anything. Yeah. And then I said, well, you know, not that I, you know, have a whole lot of money, but if you want to sell them all, you know, if they stop, you know, people aren't buying it, but if you want to sell them all, call me. So two or three years later, she calls me. Oh, I just sold them. I said, what? <laughs> You're supposed to call me before you sold them. <laughs> you know? I said, but, but I had been to her house and seen these, you know, photographs and all this. You know, I have the original writings when they were writing the book on old school uh, you lined, know, paper. lined paper yeah. in pencil. They were coming up with the wording for the seven master keys, right? Wow. And, then, and then there were photographs, you know, of Edith painting paintings that I had. Wow. I was like, whoa, this is like too crazy. So I, she calls me, I go, well, what'd you do with all the other stuff? She says, oh, I have that. I said, I want to buy it. So she said, ah, 500 bucks. I said, well, I got, you know, uh, okay, I gotta buy it, right? It was twice what I paid for all the paintings, uh, you know, but it had to be part of the whole thing. And then, you know, a couple more years went by and got connected, and in 2008, there was a show of Edith's work in a, a, a thing at the American Visionary Art Museum called All Faiths Beautiful, Atheism to Zoroastrianism. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so originally we sent him photographs, you know, I took photographs and uh, Peter sent them to them and they said, okay, well we wanted like a dozen of them and then it ended up being like 22 out of the 39. We shipped them all, we shipped all the ephemera and stuff over there. It was a year show, right? Yeah, it was, the show was open for a whole year. And the American Visionary Art Museum, if you ever go to Baltimore, that is like my favorite museum I've ever been to in my whole life. It's amazing. It's all naive, outsider, folk, self-taught artists. And, you know, it's amazing. So it turns out uh, Leonard Knight had stuff in there and a whole bunch of other people in this show that went on for a whole year there. So I had to, you know, spend the money and fly to Baltimore just to be there for the opening. And just like whoa, it was the most amazing four days. <laughs> and I we're spent, you know, probably two whole days of the four days I was there in the museum, looking at every inch of everything that was there. It's just Sounds like the right amazing. place for these paintings. Oh, oh yeah, no, it was absolutely perfect and the perfect show, mm -hmm. right? Because it was all kind of spiritual oriented through art from you know self-taught kind of individual artists who didn't even think they were artists, but, yeah. you know. Yeah, so it was an amazing experience, and they've been, you know, boxed up and stored since and I, 2009, 
and I happened to show him to Katie, oh. and she said, whoa, yeah. <laughs> we need to show these. And I like, said, the Joshua okay. Tree Art Community needs to see these, because this is so much what we're thinking about, you know? So thank you, Bob. Uh, <laughs> Ellsworth Park in LA. I don't know that neighborhood, do you? No, I don't. I, it was probably, I think it was somewhere kind of Los Feliz adjacent mm -hmm. yeah. sort of area. Oh. But wasn't, she was lame as well. She was had polio. polio. Yeah. Yeah. So she painted with her left hand and one hand. Yeah, so one of her hands was like kind of frozen and oh, couldn't work her fingers, and one of her feet has like, you know, three toes. Oh. Or wow. yeah. Yeah. So she was mainly kind of, you know, get, getting around in a wheelchair when she wasn't painting. She could stand, but if she went out, she was, you know, rolling around in a But that box is made specifically so yes. they could go out yeah. and lecture. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Wow. So here's the carrying case they took to their lectures so that they could, and they framed their yeah. work in metal so it wouldn't be hurt when it was slid into these. So you could easily carry these from lecture to lecture. Wow. And it's interesting, when you see the photographs of her as an older woman, she's no longer the Iowa aproned yeah. guest. She's got a yeah. turban. Oh, and she's really? wearing, yeah, yeah, check it out. Oh, so but cool. didn't she meet Mahatma Gandhi? She oh. was supposed to. Yeah, oh, she yeah. was supposed yeah. to. Yeah. Okay. There's no proof Obadiah that she did. Obadiah was the channeler person that she supposedly acquired a lot of the imagery for these artworks. But I'm spacing out, there was a kind of Indian uh, guru, mystic sort of type that there's, uh, I have you know, lettered, uh, letters before they went to India and Egypt from this guy, uh, I can't remember his name off It's not coming to me either. Yeah, um, and he says, oh yeah, when you get here, I want to meet, I want you to, I want to introduce you to Mahat Gandhi, and you're gonna really want to like this guy. And I was like, what? You know. And back in 1939, when they went, the wife was on the husband's passport because basically the wife was the man's <laughs> Right. And then months later, they finally changed it so women have their own passports. But you know, 1939. That, that's like my mind. That's pretty fucking recently. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, what was the year you actually bought them? I think it was like 96, 7-ish. Okay, it was later. Yeah, I just wonder if 70s, 80s. No, no, it wasn't that far back. You know. It was, it was, you know, some of the mid to late 90s. So when did those people make the cards up? So later. Well, the woman that had the other half <laughs> Of known, you know, she had like I think you know somewhere around forty paintings, but they weren't all framed like this. Some of them were different sizes and in wooden frames. Because she showed me some pictures of some of them in different frames. But she uh, took an art class and showed some of the paintings to the art teacher, and then they came up with this idea to make like a tarot book using. Edith's images and then their own writings on the back of the card. I spaced out, sorry, I wanted to bring the one, I have two packs of these cards from her. There's one in here that's sealed. Yeah, sealed. I have one that's open and I, sorry, spaced out and forgot to bring it so you could see that, but you know, if you want to come back, I'll switch. Leave them here next time they're open, and then people can look through that because that's kind of interesting as well. How you know the woman that had the other, you know, half of the collection got a spiritual thing to do something with the same images, but so on did, a whole different. So it did. It may have stopped in 1940, <laughs> but, but it continued in, in 90. Right? Yeah. It has Somebody a, took it on. Well, here we all are tonight. Uh, and yeah. then, you know, there's also the American Indian influence over in that, sure. that painting, yeah. which is really the only one that has that look. I mean, that, yeah. that, that, that look. Yeah. Yeah. See, I haven't seen all of the images of the collection that this other woman had, Donna, 
Um, but some of them, you know, as I said, weren't framed like this, and I guess were not necessarily part of their, you know, visual aids to their lectures. You're still trying to find the other collection? Well, uh, the woman sold it. She happened to call me. I said, call me if you're ever going to sell it, not that I have enough money to buy it. Well, she called me to say, oh, I just sold it. Yeah. And I was like, what? You were supposed to call me before you sold it, <laughs> when you were thinking of selling it, right? So she sold it to a guy that has a 3D glasses business in Florida. He may still have them, but I have his number. So, you know, I'm probably gonna call him and say, do you still have them? Because, you know, there isn't like a, you know, there's like four pieces that I've found on the internet that had like an auction, you know, from a decades, a couple of decades ago that were pieces uh, that she had sold through this uh, art guy in Tennessee. So I don't know if he still has them. I don't even know if he's still alive, but I have his phone number, so I'll probably call him on Monday. <laughs> and say, hey, do you still have these? What's up? At least send me images of the ones you have. Yeah, I think he'd be interested to see all of these. Yeah, yeah that's true, right? No, keep that yeah. reciprocal tied together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he asked me if I'd sell them, and at the, that point I said, no, I'm not selling them. But just so you guys I, I can't, because they're in a show in yeah. Baltimore. If you want to go look at them, go to Baltimore. <laughs> the collection is for sale as a group. Um, so if you know of any multi-billionaire people who are looking for a really excellent art history uh, take at, at the early 20th century esoteric movements, here you go. Thank you so much for coming, everybody.